Hi everyone, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Elizabeth Diggs, and on behalf of the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Michigan, I just want to thank you so much for coming. We are absolutely thrilled to have with us today Ingrid Newkirk, president and co-founder of PETA, which stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. As a brief background, Newkirk and as well as a fellow animal rights activist founded PETA in 1980. Today, PETA is the largest animal rights organization in the world with over 1.6 million members to date. Um, the organization's accomplishments, among many over the years, include things such as convincing major cosmetics companies to stop testing products on animals, pressing for higher welfare standards from the meat industry, and uncovering horrific conditions in animal laboratories, slaughterhouses, and other places where um, animals frequent and are, uh, that have led to government sanctions against companies, universities, and entertainers who have abused or used animals in some improper way. Um, as president, Ingrid Newkirk has spoken internationally on animal rights issues and continues to be a major figurehead around the globe for the animal rights movement. Um, many may argue or disagree over the tactics of PETA, but not many at all argue over the fact that it has achieved successes that have undeniably improved the lives of many countless animals. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ingrid Newkirk. Thank you very much. Can you hear me at the back? If you could, yes, okay, good. Um, I was here last year at this time, and I have to say that it was totally miserable with the snow, so we are lucky. It's almost like the University of Florida today. Um, I never thought that I would talk about Anthony Bourdain, ghastly man, but um, I have in my imagination the idea that he once ordered a crocodile sandwich, and he said to the waiter, and make it snappy. So I have so much to go through. I'm trying to stick to this, and I will try to make it snappy. So last year when I was here, um, and I've dug up some of the things from last year. Uh, people have moved on. They're now in corporate law somewhere elsewhere. Um, there was one thing I started with quoting, and I thought it was worth quoting again this year. It's um, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, had just written this. He wrote, I have spent my life fighting discrimination and injustice. What is that doing up there? <laughs> you can't get good help. <laughs> I have spent my life fighting discrimination and injustice. Whether the victims are blacks, women, or gays and lesbians, I have seen firsthand how injustice gets overlooked when the victims are powerless or vulnerable, when they have no one to speak up for them and no means of representing themselves to a higher authority. Animals are in precisely that position. Unless we are mindful of their interests and speak out loudly on their behalf, abuse and cruelty go unchallenged. Those are Desmond Tutu's words, and I think they're marvelous, and almost nothing else has to be said, so I'll leave you now. <laughs> Um, but it's not just um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu who's pushing for changes in the way that our society treats animals. There's a whole movement going on and it's growing rather rapidly because people do understand, finally, there is a commonality of interests. And since my visit last year, several things have happened that I want to mention, wonderful things. The largest seal skin processing plant in Canada closed down. Within weeks of our Angora rabbit video footage going on the web, basically every retailer in the world agreed never to sell Angora wool again. And you may shop at Zara, which is owned by Inditex. Zara not only invited us to China to go through the um, farms where the rabbits were raised for them, where they had been assured there were humane conditions, you know, this certified humane rubbish, but we did. And when we came out, we showed them the horrors that were going on there, and they immediately pulled all their angora off the shelves. It was almost a million dollars in inventory, and they allowed us to send it to Syrian refugee children. 
some of the few people in the world who have any excuse for wearing something like that. Then SeaWorld. I think most of you know about that. This animal abusement park has taken a huge hit since the movie Blackfish came out. I urge you, if you haven't seen Blackfish, it's on CNN On Demand, and it's worth seeing. SeaWorld is a business that's built on the suffering of intelligent social animals who are denied everything that's natural to them, everything that's important to them. They die prematurely of stress and other captivity-related causes. In the wild, orcas swim for many, many miles. They live in a, a pod that's made up of their mothers, their sisters, their aunts. It's a matriarchal society. And they truly never, the babies never leave their mother's side, ever. These rodeo, I call them captors, who go into the sea and capture the babies, leave the mothers and the aunts and everybody else in absolute misery. Free orcas are among the fastest animals in the world, and they swim as much as 100 miles a day. You may have seen them, a video of them in the Puget Sound, raising their children, swimming and enjoying life. At SeaWorld, they swim in endless circles in something that for them is the size of a bathtub. They're swimming in their own diluted urine and waste and chlorine. They wear their teeth down, chewing at the underwater bars. It's just all absolutely hideous. In the wild, male orcas live an average of 30 years and up to 60 years. Um, females an average of 50 years, up to 100. Orcas at sea well die by the time they reach their teens, usually. So what did we do? After Blackfish came out, we went to all the companies that sponsor or sponsored SeaWorld, and we got Southwest Airlines to take the orcas that they had painted on their planes off. Um, we got AAA to stop promoting them. We got Fromas and these other um, guides for travel to remove recommendations to go to SeaWorld, all very important things. And Mattel stopped selling SeaWorld Barbie, which I think if a plastic doll won't go to SeaWorld, that tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> then I'm sorry to drone on about this, but we want to bring this company down, so I will. <laughs> uh, my favorite was SeaWorld CEO. A new CEO went in and they asked people to tweet what they thought about SeaWorld. And so that was a major PR nightmare because people did. <laughs> and they asked things like, what do you fill your tanks with? Orca tears? Why is your parking lot bigger than the orca's tanks? Do you really believe that Shamu Stadium is, quote, the most advanced marine habitat in the world, or have you never seen the ocean? <laughs> Were you guys drunk? or stoned when you came up with this campaign? <laughs> and who hired your PR firm, and when are you getting a new one? So they came out with this multi-million dollar advertising campaign to bring people back to SeaWorld that didn't work, but here is our rather rude rebuttal to that. There are some facts about SeaWorld we'd like you to know. We used to steal orca babies from the wild, but now we masturbate them and breed mother orcas with their sons. Swimming in endless circles, attacking each other, and ramming their heads into concrete walls. Our whales are going insane. They're not doing well. And in fact, more than 30 have died. Our business is failing. But if you come to our parks, we'll tell you a bunch of lies. Why do we lie? Because if we told you the truth, you wouldn't come. And we think you're stupid. Really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so SeaWorld stock opened at $38 a share shortly after it went public in May 2013, and now it's at $17 something, so that's a crash of over 50%, and I urge you to help us make it crash entirely. So other victories, since last February, Sao Paulo has banned fur farms, Colorado has banned greyhound racing, Orange, New York requires animal abusers to register with the state, San Francisco banned all wild animal acts, Ringling Brothers announced it will retire the poor, old, lame, and possibly TB-infected elephants that they drag from city to city. Ontario banned the capture and breeding of marine mammals. The Yucatan and several Spanish cities banned bullfights. 
Mexico City banned animal circuses. What we need is for Mexico now to ban dolphinariums, these swim with programs. So if you ever go to Cancun on vacation, please avoid them. Talk to everyone you know about why the dolphins need to be free in the ocean, not in a swimming pool. And please avoid the fish pedicures. Uh, this seems to have sprung up from nowhere. I don't know what that's about. You know, you can't clean something if you've got fish in it, so somebody else puts their feet in after the, and eventually you throw them away. Peter stopped the National Institutes of Health's notorious addiction experiments on baby monkeys um, and ended dissection requirements in several more states. We rescued bears and some lone and lonely chimpanzees from roadside zoos and closed those places down. I'm just going to show you one rescue of a chimpanzee named Iris. In 2015, PETA was alerted to the plight of a 32-year-old chimpanzee named Iris. Iris was being held all alone in a tiny, barren, and dark cell at a roadside zoo called Chestity Wildlife Preserve and Zoo in Georgia. With virtually nothing to do or see and no companionship, Iris resorted to smearing her own feces on the walls of the cell as highly distraught human prisoners have been known to do. And she spent much of her time huddled under a dirty blanket. But in March 2015, a generous PETA member helped us free Iris from this hellhole. Following negotiations, Iris was released from her prison and sent to the beautiful Save the Chimps Sanctuary in Florida. At Chestity, Iris had been pale and overweight, and her legs were underdeveloped, likely from a lack of opportunities to climb or exercise. But at the sanctuary, Iris is thriving. It usually takes months to prepare rescued chimpanzees to be introduced to others of their own kind, but gentle Iris was introduced to her next door neighbor, Abdul, within days of arriving at the sanctuary. The two immediately greeted each other with hugs and kisses and groomed each other like old friends. Soon, Iris will be introduced to more chimpanzees and have the opportunity to live on a lush green island with palm trees and a chimpanzee family. Perhaps best of all, Iris will never be alone again. If you go to our website, there are also some very beautiful videos of the bears we've rescued since I was here last year. Really, really lovely to see them flourish and start to fill out and become bears again. Um, but it's all good. Things are moving, and they're moving because people are doing things to make them move. John Galsworthy was an English philosopher many years ago. He said, there are three things in life that are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. So I aspire to that. I think that's a wonderful way to live your life, is to be kind to everybody. And when I was writing a book called One Can Make a Difference, I asked the Dalai Lama to contribute something, and he did. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter what religion you are, or if you have no religion, because the overriding religion everyone should have is to be kind. And last month, funny enough, the Harvard Graduate School of Education agreed with this in a way. What it did was um, it published a report on the value of reducing competitiveness. Now, I know this may be a very daring concept, <laughs> but reducing competitiveness in favor of showing consideration for others. In other words, being kind. But there's far more to animal rights than kindness. Kindness should be enough. But there is an overriding principle that guides animal rights interests. And that is a principle that everybody except maybe Attila the Hun should subscribe to. If we're against discrimination, if we're against needless violence, if we're against injustice, then we have to be for animal rights. 
because the only thing that allows places like SeaWorld to exist and elephants to be dragged around in chains in the circus and taken away from their mothers and all the things that we do, the only thing that allows us to eat animals and wear animals and experiment on animals, use them for entertainment and kill them in hideous ways because they're a nuisance is prejudice. That's all it is, prejudice. And prejudice has never ever justified discrimination. The one thing we have to throw out is that prejudice, the way we would throw out last week's moldy leftovers. So I want to take a sidebar, because people have asked me about this when they knew I was coming, on something that a lot of people care about, and that's the environment. And I want to say that it is as impossible to be a meat and dairy eating environmentalist as it is for Donald Trump to give a lecture on the Hadron Super Collider. <laughs> so here, I'm just going to rattle off some statistics. A staggering 51% of global greenhouse emissions are caused by animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is the largest source of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions in the whole world. And here's Pam Anderson making the point. More than half the water in the US is used up by animal agriculture. It drains the aquifers. It causes militant cattle ranchers to storm federal wildlife preserves, foolishly forgetting to take snacks with them. So here we are. Where are we? Here we are. Can't get good help, I'm telling you. Uh, here we are. This is um, Peter people going up to the refuge, taking snacks, but for the reporters, the people inside, and everybody else. And so whenever they held a news conference about the need to take over the wildlife refuge, we were there with our signs uh, putting down their ranching practices. For every one pound of fish caught, five pounds of unintended marine species are caught and discarded as what's called by-kill. And that means dolphins and turtles and rays. 110 animal and insect species are lost every single day from rainforest destruction. 91% of Amazon destruction is caused by animal agriculture. And that's just the Amazon. There's a lot happening here. Farmed animal manure, which is 130 times that of the whole human population, 130 times that of the whole human population is fouling our waterways. It's killing wildlife. It's killing everything, and it's making kayaking less pleasant. A third of all our raw materials in the United States go into animal agriculture, a third. One smallish dairy farm, which is smallish means 2,500 cows, produces more fecal matter than the whole of Minneapolis. And don't make jokes about the people of Minneapolis. We slaughter over 27 billion living beings every year in the United States alone. For what? A fleeting taste. That's all. Something that we grew up getting accustomed to. A taste that we find hard to get rid of. In one year in the United States, we throw away more than 15 billion pounds of animals' bodies, more than 3 billion pounds of eggs, and 25 billion pounds of dairy products. What that means, if you think about it, is of course that thinking, feeling, sentient animals who saw what was coming in front of them, who didn't want to be on that transport truck, didn't understand where they were going, but smelt the death in front of them, were killed so that they could end up on a tray outside a hotel room or in the garbage behind a restaurant in the dumpster. And this doesn't count the ones who are killed in transit. Pigs, they have skin just like ours. And when the sleet that comes through those slats in winter, their skin freezes to the sides of the trucks. You read the United States Department of Agriculture reports and you will see that pigs have to be peeled off the sides of trucks. It also doesn't count those who die on the farm from rectal prolapse and things like that, where they often lie for days because no one who runs a factory farm wants to put the money 
into veterinary care? Why would they? when all you see at the supermarkets is a price war on who can sell the cheapest, cheapest meat. We've documented that on every single farm that we've been to. So on our website, please go and look for yourself. There are pigs, even for Whole Foods, and they're humane meat pigs. Much of the waste is from chickens. That's because, if you don't know this figure, this is a, an amazing figure. In the United States, we eat one million chickens every hour. And if you've ever known chickens, and I have, I've taken in rescued chickens, they have personalities just like any dog. You know, in the Philippines or Vietnam, somebody's eating a dog. But they all have personalities. They're living beings with thoughts and feelings. One more environmental thing. We used to think of leather as just a byproduct of the meat industry. So what the hell? If you're going to eat the cow or the pig, then you might as well use the leather. That makes you responsible. Um, I never understood that, because one is a despicable industry. Why should it validate another despicable industry? But now we know leather isn't a byproduct of the meat industry. It's a co-product. It's even Stephen because like water subsidies, it props up the meat industry. And perhaps this is a revelation, but most leather comes from India. There's very little meat on those cows by the time they reach the slaughterhouse, so the money is in leather. People sometimes say, ooh, but isn't leather natural? I mean, it's natural. It's not like vinyl, PVC or something. No, it isn't natural. It's natural when it's on the cow. But in order to make it into a shoe or a bag or a belt or something, you have to process it. You have to treat it with what are broadly called mortants. Mort, from the word more, to die. You have to treat it so that it doesn't rot. And that means an incredible amount of uh, chemicals. If you visit Kanpur in India and all the villages around it, which are major leather processing places, you will see adults and children covered in rashes, in painful sores, open wounds, because the main culprit is chromium, which is carcinogenic, causes muta mutations and birth defects in all living things. Also, problems come from benzene-based dyes, chromate, bichromate salts, butyl acetate, ethanol, sulfuric acid, and ammonium hydrogen sulfide. These are what cause the allergic reactions and the skin lesions and what you see on the children and the people in the villages. Premature death in these places among human beings is up to a whopping 90% of those who work in the vats, drink from the water, the effluent, and wash in and do their laundry in the rivers into which the effluent from the tanneries flows. They have no choice. These are poor villagers. There is nothing they can do. They cast their nets for sick fish who are swimming in this effluent too. And they wash their saris and dry their saris on the banks using that water. Men, even youngsters, stand day after day bare-legged in the tanning vats. They cough from lung disease, but they keep going because they don't have any options. Poor villagers used to have an agricultural life. The tannery effluent has now poisoned the soil to such an extent that plants don't grow. And that means that their cattle can't feed. So what can they do? It's a question of work in the tanneries and die, or don't work in the tanneries and die. So, Author Annie Leonard asks, what kind of woman of reproductive age would ever work in a job exposed to mutagens, tetratoxins, chemicals that cause birth defects, except one who has no option? So animal rights and human rights are one thing. You poison everything. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the meat industry, the dairy industry, the leather industry are all exploitive industries and they're all interconnected. Luckily, you can find vegan clothes, vegan shoes everywhere you look now. You can get very chic ones from Natalie Portman. 
You can get Stella McCartney, who knows what. Even Payless. I think those boots are from Payless. And there's everything. You can have bondage wear, if you like. Gailey and, and Sian <laughs> Ferrani uses two to three tons of recycled bicycle tires to make everything from dresses, including wedding dresses, to shorts. You can even get party things, gym clothes, gym bags made out of gum wrappers, out of recycled plastic, out of, out of everything. So that was my sidebar on the environment, which is tied in intrinsically to animal rights. So now I'll go back to kindness. When we were children, most of us grew up surrounded by animal images. We loved animals. We had animal books, we had animal toys, we had animal everything, and we loved them, loved them. I don't know if you've seen on the internet, there is a, um, a video of a child who is in uh, somewhere in South America who's being fed uh, his lunch, and there's a piece of octopus in the lunch. Has anyone seen that? So, and he questions his mother. You know, a child shall lead them, and the mother starts crying when he says, why did an octopus have to die to make my lunch? All over the internet, you see kids hugging animals because they think of them as their friends. Like that. <laughs> and <I've, laughs> the rooster's jealous. And I just heard, someone just told me a story of um, a child who came home from school and was laughing and laughing. And his mother said to him, why are you laughing? And he said, mommy, you will never believe it. He said, the teacher showed us all the animals today. And we named all the animals. And he said, the chicken has the same name as our food. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if children knew, they wouldn't eat that. So what happens to us? It's only because they don't know that they eat it. Because they love animals. 99% of kids love animals. But what happens to us when we grow up? What hardens our hearts? What makes us laugh at things that are not funny about cruelty to animals? What makes us ashamed of our emotions, which are an integral part of us? We're not robots. No one should ever say, oh, so-and-so is being emotional. Great thing, your emotions. They rule a huge part of your life. They are your intuition. They tell you how to behave to others. They show you when someone is good. So emotion's good. But what happens? Because if we stepped out of here, all of us, and we saw a dog being beaten up on the street, I know that almost everybody in this room would do something. We would try to interfere. We would try to stop that person. We would call for help. We would do something. So what is it that makes us turn a blind eye to what we do by paying other people to be cruel to other animals with just as much feeling? And in fact, far worse than one or two dogs being beaten up on the street, we turn a blind eye to institutionalized, corporate animal cruelty on a massive scale. You remember those figures of billions every year just in this country screaming down the line. Blind Eye, Al Gore's film. One inconvenient truth wasn't mentioned in it. Do you remember that? The United Nations report on global climate change had already come out, and it said animal-based agriculture is more damaging to the environment and more to blame for global climate change than all the planes and cars and other forms of transportation <coughs> in the world. You can actually drive a Hummer. You can drive a fleet of Hummers. You can leave your shower running. You can throw trash in the, You can do anything you want. And it will not equal the amount of chicken wings that somebody orders up to eat with their friends during the Super Bowl. Why was that left out? Was it because El Gore's family raised Black Angus cattle? Was it because he loved steak, which he did? But eventually, that brick wall that was in front of him fell. He couldn't retain that anymore and pretend that environmentalism meant something to him if he was still contributing 
to one of its chief, if not its chief, causes, eating animals and products. If you hit your head against a brick wall, often enough the brick wall will fall. And so Al Gore became a vegan. Yes! <laughs> Bill Clinton had already beaten him to the punch and become an outspoken vegan, he said, because he wanted to see his grandchildren not collapse on his way running to the McDonald's, which we used to see him do in Washington. And look at his physical transformation. He looks just great now. His friend, James Cameron, beat him to it. You know James Cameron, the movie director? Cameron was given an award by the National Geographic Society for his work with submersibles. He has taken a submersible down to the deepest point that we know of on the Earth. And this record-breaking sea dive uh, made him the recipient of a National Geo Prize. When he took the podium, he didn't talk about submersibles. He said to everybody in the room, please, if there's one thing you do, go vegan. That way you'll save the planet. So it's happening. This is a far cry from when I was in France about 10 years ago. I went into a restaurant and I said to the waitress, um, what do you have? I'm a vegan. And she wrinkled her face up in that wonderful way that French people can and said, oh, c'est bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> now if you go to France, France's perhaps arguably most famous chef is Alain Ducasse. And he runs um, a restaurant with the same name in the Paris Athenaeum. And if you have about 300 bucks that you don't really know what to do with and you find yourself in Paris, you can have vegan lunch in his restaurant. You will need to probably forego your tuition for the next year if you want to have wine with it. And maybe for the next couple of years if you want to have dinner. But it's vegan. So things are happening. In 2012, the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness was signed. That's Cambridge, England, by an international. <laughs> they can do it down the road, too. That's great. Signed by an international group of prominent scientists. And here's what they proclaimed. Pretty basic. Animals are conscious and aware to the degree humans are. All mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, possess the very same neurological substrates as human beings. In other words, if you stand on the toes or tentacles or snatch the offspring out of their arms or their nests, they would be as upset about it as we would be if it happened to us. So here you have the body of scientific evidence that all living beings are sentient in front of us and we mustn't ignore it. It can't just be interesting to know that. Knowing that, surely, if we are intelligent animals, should inform our behaviors and help us cast off our bad habits. <laughs> this is when the Pope, Pope was our man of the year for rather obvious reasons. I say that as an atheist, but he was. Um, when he came to Washington, we went out with our nuns, eating meat is a bad habit, and so on. And I love the bearded nun <laughs> on the right. So let's put it in historic context. Human beings think we're incredibly smart. We invented Cheetos and the self-cleaning oven, so I suppose we might be. But it really wasn't very long ago that we did terrible, terrible things to other human beings because we didn't accept that they weren't less than ourselves. And terrible things happened in this very town, in Boston, that were considered normal and right. It wasn't very long ago, not here, but it wasn't very long ago, well, in this country, that savage, Native Americans were forced from their homelands and they were marched down the Trail of Tears. Or that orphans, and that was here, were so devalued that they were used in tuberculin experiments. And in fact, Irish immigrant women were used in practice gynecological surgeries so that surgeries could be perfected for rich women who weren't migrants. GIs were given LSD without their knowledge. 
And some of them thought that they were going crazy and killed themselves. But GIs were disposable. They were just poor class men who came into the military. It wasn't that long ago. It may seem a long time when you're young, but it wasn't that long ago that the Holocaust was a reality. And it was experienced by millions of Jews and gypsies and homosexuals. And the final solution, of course, was to round them up and gas them. Powerful, influential people were fine with that. And neighbors turned against neighbors and did the terrible things. There's a chilling book I recommend it. It's called The Nazi Doctors. It's a sociological study of the behavior of people in concentration camps. And what it shows is that ordinary people performed atrocities against others because they thought of them as inferior. At the time of the suffragettes, the first women's liberationists, women who demanded the right to vote, not much to demand, were force-fed the way prisoners are force-fed at Guantanamo. Women were considered so below men, they couldn't only not own property, but they were considered property. That is not very long ago. It was perfectly reasonable for men to rape their wives. The idea of forced sexual intercourse, of rape in a marital situation, is a relatively new concept. Women had no say. Women were also thought to be so daft and so weak that they were denied entry into medical school because it was thought that they would faint at the sight of blood. Which, if you think about that, is rather an odd thing to think. <laughs> I think that today, men who thought that, if you could tell them today, they would faint to know that there are more female medical school graduates than there are males. And it was very funny, I don't know if you read, when Storm Jonas hit Washington and other areas recently, that um, Senator Lisa Murkowski said that the only people who showed up on Capitol Hill, from members of Congress to pages to administrative support, were women. And I thought, what a terribly missed opportunity that day was. So one final example. Very well-educated people actually believed that black people were so stoic they couldn't experience maternal or paternal love. People honestly believed it. There were editorials in the Boston Globe justifying the right of slaveholders, slaveholders to sell black children into servitude at farms so distant that their parents never saw them again. And there is a book in which I read a story, a poem actually, about a mother, a slave mother, who would work in the fields all day, back-breaking labor, I'm sure, and then at night she would walk 12 miles there and back to see the place where they had put her daughter, just to watch her daughter sleeping, and then come back to the fields so to the, where she slept so that she wouldn't be beaten the next day. They believed it. It was justified. And around the same time I read that, I read a story in the British press. And this was about a mother cow who had had her calf sold away, because that's what they do on dairy farms, so that the males are made into veal. And she broke through a fence, and she walked seven miles down a lane, broke through that fence, found her calf, and the next morning, when the farmer went into the barn, he found her nursing her calf. So don't let anyone tell a cow that maternal love is a human characteristic. A mother's love is a mother's love. Easy. Like this. More? Yes. Yes. Or? <laughs> And this, I love this one. I always use this one because she's showing you her baby. <laughs> and this is grainy, but this goes, I'm going to show you an old uh, Spanish Child Welfare Society video.
for once in your life, we ask you to behave like an animal. The Child Welfare Organization. Love that film. Anyway, the atrocities that I described were day-to-day -day reality for people just like us. And of course, we're appalled by them now. But the thing is that there's no challenge to condemning what happened in the past. We can all do that. It was the past. The real challenge is to look at what we're doing today, look at what our great-grandchildren, perhaps, or grandchildren will look back at us and say, how could you have been oblivious to that? How could you have ignored it? How could you have not acted? Slavery isn't just human slavery. If you're honest with yourself, you read the dictionary definition, you look at the circus, for example, 18 orphaned baby elephants, and orphaned because they were taken from their mother, were just moved here from um, Zimbabwe to go into our zoos. And there was an international outroar, outroar, but it didn't stop it. This is what they do. This is how they train baby elephants. I am so pleased that Ringling has decided to take those elephants off the road after 35 years of protest. But this is when they take a baby elephant away, they tie them down, and they beat them with what's called a bull hook, which is a heavy wooden stake with a hook on one end. So the challenge is to be understanding and compassionate to the smallest, the strangest, the most unfamiliar to us. Yes, there are differences. There are differences between men and women. There are differences in skin color. There's difference between me and some other animals. So what? No differences justify the abuse of another. If we believe that might doesn't make right, and we all say we do, and every parent, hopefully, teaches their child that might doesn't make right, then we have to apply the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For years, people believed that humans were the only ones to use tools, and that's been disabused. We found that chimpanzees do, otters do. We had that, maybe. No, crows, we've got crows. Crows do, crows figure out they can use stones to make water levels rise in a jar and get their prize to float. Okay, that's good. Look at this squirrel, who's not going to be defeated by a firmly twisted on cap of food that was left for birds. People like some species and they don't like others, but he's going to work at that, and he's going to figure it out. And then I want you to see what he does. He doesn't, he takes it and hides it. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's this bird who has shows the sense of play. He's figured out how to take a plastic lid and amuse himself on a snowy day <laughs> by going up and down. And this just goes on. He just has a wonderful time with his peers. <laughs> so other animals have the same feelings as this animal right here. And these animals here. We all feel love and we feel joy. Look at these cows released from a barn in spring after being holed up all winter. That's good. It's just joy. And animals feel fear. This is a Chinese circus, like any other circus. You can see the bear is deeply unhappy. The monkeys are treated like toys, who of course aren't toys, so they wouldn't have to be beaten to perform. Here they sit subserviently on their cinder blocks waiting for the next command, because if they misbehave, they're going to get it and they know it. And they feel loneliness. If you kick them in the face the way men in the stockyards do, and I've been in the stockyards and seen it, they see, they feel exactly the same pain as we do. And what about fish? The uncomfortable fact is that we know that fish are clever. They have mathematical abilities that are shown to be on a par with those of monkeys, dolphins, and human youngsters. 
If they escape a net, they can remember for seven years not to make that same mistake again. They're communicative, they're sensitive, they have sensory hairs on their backs, which are um, things that allow them to register vibrations and know when they should move. They have electrical uh, fields. They have taste buds in their throats and their lips and their noses. They're extremely sensitive to stimuli so that the pain that they experience when they're hooked is especially acute. We have this ad. If you wouldn't do this, you know, go back, if you wouldn't do this to a dog, why would you do it to a fish? That is less painful to a dog than this is to a fish because their lips are so sensitive. The New York Times recently reported fish use luminescence to communicate and they cry for help when they're pursued by predators. So people always say to me, well, what about catch and release? And I'm reminded of Ellen DeGeneres, who had a joke long ago where she's driving along and she sees two elderly people walking and she runs her car into them and knocks them down. And as they're trying to get up, she rolls down the window and she says, it's okay, you can go now. I just wanted to see if I could do it. <laughs> so it made me realize an experience I had with an eel who had been caught. And I won't tell you that because we're running out of time that it's what's inside that counts. This is a whale's eye. This is an elephant's eye. This is a duck's eye. This is a human's eye. And there's someone in there, in all of them. There's someone inside. We're taught we shouldn't bully others because of what they look like, what they sound like, where they come from, that their culture is different. This is the same thing. We should judge the book not by its cover, but what is inside. Before Jane Goodall, we didn't have a clue that chimpanzees are so like us that they lie to their siblings, their mothers, by blaming their siblings for naughty things that they do. And they have sex with <coughs> other chimpanzees behind their mates' backs, something I would say they learn from members of Congress. <laughs> We didn't know that bottlenose dolphins whistle the individual names of their loved ones when they're in distress. Or that parrots give their babies a unique name that those babies will respond to for the rest of their lives. Given a chance, they watch, they figure things out. There are lots of videos on the internet of horses opening barn doors, letting their friends out, going in fields. Here's a little video of cows who have figured things out with opening gates with their tongues. Two latches on that one, going to not nail it. Yep. And of operating water pumps with their horns. Up on the left, down on the right. And then they can drink. Today, a whopping 60% of people who have been polled have no idea that a cow has to get pregnant, has to give birth to produce milk. People think that cows just naturally have milk they don't know what to do with. But that's not how it happens. And most people don't know that cows are impregnated through artificial insemination on what farmers themselves call a rape rack, which means that a farmer gets semen from a bull and sticks it up inside the cow. That is rape, and that is not pleasant for a female or anybody of any species. We now know cows use almost imperceptible facial movements to communicate, something we didn't know five or 10 years ago. Here, is, here are the cows being removed from their calves, being removed from their mothers so that we can have the cheese the milk for the cheese that goes on our pizza topping, and these wonderful big mothers can do nothing except miss their babies, follow their babies, hope someone will not be so wretched as to take them away. And here is what happens to the calves on dairy farms. They have their horns burned out of their heads. Did anyone know why dairy cows don't have horns? It's because not they're born that way. They have them burned out of their heads. If people can't see suffering in fish, pity the lobsters and crabs. This is a Peter investigation of Linda Bean. They're alive when they have their faces pushed into the whirling brush or their limbs torn off. I know it's a cultural thing, but 
lets nobody eat lobster. Lambs shipped in all temperatures to be made into chops. And here is shearing, which is thought to be so benign. I mean, what could be wrong with getting wool from sheep? We have been on three continents. No, yes, three continents. Punching them in the face, bashing them, kicking them, throwing them down chutes, standing on them, hitting them, throwing to the ground, stomping on them. We have been in 17 shearing sheds on three continents. They bleed, they're cut with such speed. Some of these men are on amphetamines because they have to work so quickly. And when they cut them up, they will sometimes even break their necks, twisting them to make them behave. Pigs are beaten because they're so lame from being genetically engineered that they can't walk properly because they're so heavy. Octopus is now a fad food. It's going to be marine food. This farmed. octopus has a nifty trick. Sorry. It uses discarded coconut shells to hide from potential threats. Small octopuses like these can transport shells for future use too. They drape their bodies over the hollow of the shell. With their tentacles dangling over the edges, they can scuttle off with their hideout. This one has even worked out how to assemble a shelter from two half shells. It keeps a lookout through the gap between them. These are the first invertebrates that have been seen using tools. But they've been known to abandon their tools as well as seen here when the camera gets a bit too close. I'm going to try to wrap up quickly. There's so much to say. Um, chickens, University of Bristol, they now have been shown to be able to count to at least five. And if you put a piece of melon in front of a chicken and teach them that if you don't eat that piece of melon, you'll get two pieces of melon, the chicken will exercise self-control, something you will never find with children. Um, although some animals cannot exercise self-control, dogs. He's being so patient. <laughs> but when you think about McNuggets, please think about chickens being thrown into crates to make them. Again, time is money, everybody just tosses them in, they break wings, they break legs, they get hematomas. Does anybody in here have a, oh well, let me do this first. There's, you've got ducks and geese plucked, plucked alive, just standing on there. This is live plucking. Does anyone here have a Canada goose jacket? Not gonna say it. But if you see a Canada goose jacket, please take it back to the store and turn it in. It's coyote, steel jaw leg hold trap coyote on the collar, and it's live plucked or other get down from geese and ducks. Not acceptable, 2016, don't need it, not survivalists. Take it back and demand a refund and buy something else, please. Anyway, um, I just wanted to show you a little brief thing of what is happening to animals in labs since Harvard has a lab. Thank God the monkey lab is closing down this year. Convulsing, fed pesticides, fed chemicals. We still have electrodes implanted into animals' brains. There's a lot of money in animal expert. Look at the fear. The fear is palpable. It's not just physical pain. It's just not knowing dumped on the ground after surgery. These are all undercover videos that our investigators shot. He's so desperate. So here is the famous Birkin bag, which we call the bath bag, made from ostrich. And the reason we do is because those goosebumps that you see on those bags are where the feathers are taken out of the ostrich. Don't need it. You now have a Birkin instead of a Birkin, which is a vegan one. Here is here are the ostriches, beautiful, incredibly curious, wonderful animals for a fashion bag. So to sum up, what we do to animals is immoral, it's needless, it's unconscionable, doesn't have to happen. We have options to absolutely everything. I think of W.S. Mervyn's poem called Good People, and that's what I think we all are. We are good people. 
He said, from the kindness of my parents, I suppose it was, that I held that belief about suffering, imagining that if only it would come to the attention of any person with normal feelings, certainly anyone literate who might have gone to college, they would comprehend pain when it went on before them, whenever they saw it happen, in the time of pain, the present, they would try to stop the bleeding, for example, with their hands. But it escapes their attention. Or well, there may be reasons for it. The victims under the blankets, the meat counters, the maimed kids, the animals, the animals staring from the end of the world. Albert Einstein said, a human being is part of the whole the universe, yet he sometimes experiences, somehow experiences himself, his thoughts and his feelings as somehow separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. Our task as good people must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening the circle of our compassion to embrace all living beings. That must be our goal to connect and to protect. And I will not do the rest of my talk. I will just thank you very, very much for coming, for paying attention, and wish you well in everything you do to make a kinder world. Thank you.